Hi, my name is Paul Shulshinsky. I'm the CEO of Moville Mortgage and Finance. I've been in the mortgage industry since 1985. I started in Encino, California, and I too am an alumni of Nefish Benefish. I started getting involved in the market here in the early 90s. I was also involved in various initiatives with the government from the uh, initiative of creating a secondary mortgage market which did not pan out to um, Israeli consumer credit reporting, which today is a standard for every consumer um, loan, uh, especially the Israeli mortgage market. So this joke um, is an old joke. The comic, the, the comic that did this, actually, I reached out to his family. Unfortunately, he had passed away. But when I found this, I said, wow, this guy, this guy really understood the mortgage industry because there are two factors. One is knowing what questions to ask. The other factor is understanding when to ask those questions. And one of the things I'm looking to accomplish that is giving you some of that information, some of that context to understand what the questions are you should be asking and when you should be asking them. And probably most importantly that I want to stress is that you should be asking them. What we're going to cover is discussing how you qualify, what the factors are you need and what the bank is going to look at, what you need to provide for that qualification and the various aspects that they're going to look at. In addition, we're going to discuss what type of mortgages are available and what you can get. Before we get into the details, I want to give you some broader context. And I want you to understand the difference between the mortgage market in Israel and the mortgage market in wherever you are, whether it's the U.S. or Canada. For the most part, the U.S. and Canada have had mortgage markets that have evolved over the past century plus. In the U.S., it's well, significantly more than a century. And in Canada, it's a little less. But from the infrastructure, from investors, to regulatory infrastructure, to all the third parties that service that market have been in place for a long time. And I do apologize to the Canadians because I looked for an icon in Canada that was similar to Uncle Sam, but I couldn't find anything. The icon with Uncle Sam is meant to stress the idea that this is an older market and a mature market. Both the U.S. and Canada is very similar. Whereas Israel, Israel is a very young market. I have been in the mortgage market actually longer than the banks, than the industry here in terms of the banks giving their own money. Because until 1990, for the most part, the Israeli government provided all the mortgage funds and the banks just basically processed them. So you can understand that since 2002, is really when the first major regu regulatory uh, changes were made and, and a really broader infrastructure started that was because of 2008. And recently, there's been also a push for different types of consumer disclosure to a protection regulation that started. We'll discuss this a little later on. Another one of the differences, again, based on the age of the market and whatnot, is because of the infrastructure, because of everything that's developed in the U.S. and Canada over many, many decades, for the most part, when you get a, a, a mortgage, whether it's from a bank or from some third a, other entity, they try to take care of everything for you, whether they're doing this directly or for third parties. Israeli banks don't have that infrastructure. And for the most part, they're going to ask the borrower to do it themselves. So it's sort of the difference between getting it delivered to you and a bit of a paper chase. So we're gonna start with mortgage basics. The first mortgage basic is loan to value. This is a term that I'm sure everybody has heard before, and I apologize for the, to the people that are very familiar with this, but I'm gonna explain it, what it means, so that anybody that really does understand it will understand, and we'll see it. But then there's also some ramifications on a regulatory basis depending on citizenship. Loan to value is simply your mortgage 
amount divided by the value of the property. And the value of the property is determined by the lower of your purchase price or the appraised value. And that appraisal that establishes that appraised value has to be done by one of the appraisers that the bank has listed and authorized to do the appraisal for your particular mortgage. Every mortgage has a different uh, list of appraisers. Now, the Bank of Israel regulates the loan to value, the maximum loan to value, so that an Israeli citizen can get up to a 75% loan to value. Say up to a 75% loan to value because it depends on two things. They could only own one property, and if they do own another property, they have to commit to selling it within a, the specified amount of time for the law at that time. Or um, they, or they're limited if they if they're going to keep both properties. They're going to be limited to fifty percent. The other factor is obviously they need the financial qualification, which we'll speak about a little bit later. But the the regulation stipulates up to seventy five percent, so the minimum loan amount that is really I'm sorry, the minimum down payment that the uh, that an Israeli citizen can have is 25%. A non-Israeli citizen is limited to a maximum loan to value of 15%. Again, the same factors as before. It means they have to be able to qualify for that um, all the financial requirements, which means that their minimum down payment is 50%. So in Israel, interest rates, the, the mortgage banks offer mortgages that are fixed and adjustable at terms very similar to the U.S. in terms of the number of years. You have 30 year fixed rates like you find in the U.S. and you have adjustables that range from uh, things that what used to be called the U.S. floaters, meaning Bank of Israel Prime that could change it anytime the Bank of Israel adjusts the um, base rate that determines the prime rate to everything from three to six month adjustables based on foreign currency, for example, the U.S. dollar, to everything from one, five, seven, ten year adjustables, uh, and of course the third year fixed. The issues, though, are there are some real differences, and I do apologize. I think my kids call that a dad joke, but the real I'm going to bring up a couple of times, and you'll see why it is so significant. Okay, let's talk about some of the attributes that are unique to the Israeli mortgage market that you don't find in the U.S. mortgage market or Canadian, and that also open up some interesting possibilities. So the first is the fact that we talked about the fixed mortgage, uh, fixed interest rate mortgages, and we talked about the adjustable interest rate mortgages like you have in the US and Canada. Well, one of the factors that are unique in Israel is that you can have one mortgage that has both fixed and adjustable interest rates as long as different other parameters that we're going to see shortly. The other factor is a fundamental factor that it reaches beyond mortgages and has a history. And that is the type of interest. How the interest is calculated. So that we're not talking about fixed or adjustable. We're talking about how is that fixed and adjustable calculated. So here's the real difference I was talking about, and I did apologize for playing this joke too much, but it's something to keep in mind, and it's very important, because there are real interest rates, and there are nominal interest rates. And for most people, unless you're in, um, in the financial industry or investments, or you're, you're very involved in your own investments, the term real interest may not mean anything to you. You've got to think to yourself, well, is it all interest real? Real interest in short just means that you want to make sure that after inflation, you are getting a certain return. This is, this is the reason investors look at real interest. For borrowers in North America, real interest is not something they come into contact with. 
investors may, depending on what they invest in, but not borrowers. In Israel, it's a major factor. Why? Because as I mentioned, before 1990, all the uh, funds for mortgages came from the government. And the government in the 70s and 80s dealt with triple digit inflation. So in that time, everything in the economy was linked to inflation from the mortgages to the salaries to credit cards, car loans, you name it. So fast forward a few decades and today, not everything is linked to inflation. In fact, most things are not. However, there's a lot of consumer finance as well as other types of small business finance that are still linked to inflation. So the bank can offer you either. They can offer you a fixed rate mortgage that is not linked to inflation or a fixed rate mortgage that is linked to inflation. Let's see, let's see what that means. So let's talk about nominal interest. And again, I'm using the terms casually and sort of their, you know, for the for their common use, not a technical or academic in case we have any finance professors that are upset about how, how I'm using it. But nominal, think of the nominal interest. You get a fixed rate mortgage in the US or you have your five year adjustable in Canada. And you know if you're getting a mortgage at 5% or 6%, you know that's what you're paying. That on an annual basis, on the outstanding balance, that's how much you pick. That's nominal interest. You basically see, right, what you get in terms of cost of money. And you think of interest just like a rental thing, because you're renting the money until you get it back. So it's just like a rental contract where you know every month what you're going to pay. And that's the case when you have a fixed rate nominal interest mortgage. Real interest in Israel is known as ribit samud lematat, which means that it's linked to the consumer price index or, or CPI. Now, what that means is that you basically, in terms of your cost of money, what the what, what the mortgage actually costing you, you're going to see what you get because it it is reported. The government issues the official. Um, index for inflation once a month. And it's based on that, that mortgages that are linked to inflation are calculated. So effectively, you could have a fixed rate mortgage that is adjusting once a month. So if you have a fixed rate mortgage that's linked to inflation and you have 5% interest and inflation is 3%, effectively, it's costing you 8%. Now, you don't have to get this, but it's one of the choices. And it's one of those questions you have to know to ask to make sure you're not getting this. There are a few exceptions where it can be worthwhile, but again, beyond the scope of our, of our webinar. Let's talk about one mortgage with multiple sets of terms. Here's an example. And again, there are many, many examples. You can have 10 parts here if we wanted to, but here's an example where I use three different parts and the three different parts have different types of interest. They have different currencies and different terms. So the bottom, the 4.95 fixed is very similar to what you have in the U.S. and Canada. It's a 30-year fixed rate mortgage that is not linked to novel interest. The one exception is there are prepayment penalties. We'll talk about that. Uh, a little later on. Uh, the other two parts, one is linked to the dollar, which just like when it's linked to inflation means that once it funds, it gets a dollar value, even though you're, you've are you borrowed, those you've gotten, or, or you're, you, the, the people you're buying from got shekels for the bank, and you're paying back in shekels, but those shekels are constantly quoted in the value of the original dollar balance of the mortgage. The other is a seven-year adjustable that is linked to inflation, and each one has a different amortization because the seven-year can only have an amortization that is in denominations of seven. But 
with even though the street parts you have one mortgage payment it's all in one mortgage and you'll have at least three different amortization schedules and i say at least because if your purchase contract requires six different fundings each one will have a separate amortization schedule let's talk about amortization in general what your op options are for how you pay back the mortgage now amortization is one of those terms that everybody hears it's quite simply it's just a calculation um similar to use is a fixed rate mortgage you have a fixed rate mortgage over 30 years at five percent and you'll pay back the exact same amount on your first payment as you did uh, as you will on your 360th payment and that's basically amortization calculates how on each one of those payments all 360 the amount that's allocated to principal and interest constantly changes so that is that is a standard in Israel that is available uh, it is referred to in Hebrew as Spitzer why again when the government was the source of, of mortgage funds there was a Mr. Spitzer in the Ministry of Finance who had made tables for everybody and those tables became known as Luach Spitzer and to this day it is still used it's still referred to amortization still called Spitzer another less common alternative that many of the banks offer is to have a fixed principal payment and then every month the amount of interest that's due changes because of whatever the outstanding balance is uh, in normal circumstances that is going to um, equate to a a higher payment up front and a, a lower payment uh, later on interest only is available in israel but not the way it is in in the u.s and I believe you have something similar in Canada. Here it is available either on a short-term basis, uh, one, two, or three years as part of a longer-term uh, amortized mortgage, or it can be for a bridge loan. But it is that is heavily that is regulated by the Bank of Israel. Now it is important to note that in Israel, the age of the borrower can affect the term and loan and thereby the amortization and this is not something from the bank of israel this is just something they the market here the mortgage banks picked up from england where it is it was commonplace throughout today it's not uh, on 100 percent loans but it's it's commonly done and what that means is that they the default is by the age of 80 they want it fully paid off sometimes it'll go to 85 which means that if you take the age of the borrower and subtract that from 85, then you'll get the possible amortization up to 30 years. Bottom line, if you're over 50, then you're gonna start, you, you may have, you may not be able to get a 30 year mortgage. Again, this is one of those situations where the particular situation, you know, there's, there are various ways to uh, alleviate that restriction but that is you know based on your uh, personal situation mortgages in Israel could also be available in various currencies for the most part these are the linked currencies like we talked before where you're borrowing in shekels and you're paying back in shekels but the outstanding balance and your monthly mortgage payment is always calculated based on whatever the exchange rate and based on that foreign currency value when you originally got the mortgage in a few banks with very limited you can actually get a mortgage in that currency so instead of borrowing shekels that are linked to the dollar you could actually borrow dollars and also pay it back as dollars but those are much more limited and understandably um, they're also a little more expensive now, there is disclosure in Israel. In fact, over the past, say, 12 months, they've made major, major uh, progress in that. But again, because the market and the regulation is so new comparatively to what you're used to in the U.S. and Canada, it is limited. And you don't have the same scope of information or the same detail of information 
or any of the requirements and outs presented to you. And by the way, this is true for almost all of the, other than the insurance industry, almost all industries in Israel that are consumer facing. That being said, you don't have to worry about that. The, the industry is interested in helping and explaining things to consumers. It's just, what is the bar and what are the norms? In the US and Canada, your norms are much, much at a higher level because of the regulatory environment and the decades of fleshing that out and the details it needs to be and how it needs to be presented. Let's talk about basic mortgage qualification factors, just like in the States. Income to debt ratios are everything. To have an income to debt ratio, you have to document your income. And to document your income means that whether it's tax returns, uh, pay stubs, depending on the person, it's very similar to what is referred to in the U.S. as a full doc Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac mortgage. And that being said, I, I apologize, I've been involved in, in the Canadian market to a limited extent, and I've spoken in, in the JCC, but I'm not as familiar with the Canadian market as I am with the U.S. I'm going to use the U.S. for examples here in, in contrast. Um, compared to the U.S., they are a little less stringent with a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, full doc mortgage. If it's not on your 1040, um, then there is no explaining it. In Israel, um, depending on the situation, whether it's uh, a trust, whether there's a number, of, a number of situations where you could have cash flow, but it's not showing up on your tax return with them because of a lost carry forward, because of depreciation, etc. So they are a little more tolerant of that here if they understand, right? Many bankers don't. So you have to find somebody that understands it or the ability to explain it to them. The income ratios are also, they're looking at your mortgage payment divided by your net after tax income, less certain types of ongoing monthly payments you have based on debt, etc. Unlike the US and Canada, this is not as standardized a process. So really there's a, a lot of play from bank to bank. There is a regulatory limitation they look at of a 40% overall ratio, but how you get to that 40% is not as detailed or standardized as you find in North America. Credit history you are going to need to give them your know, credit report credit score from uh, US or Canada. And unlike, again, uh, I believe that the, in the US, this is the case, I believe it's Canada as well. In the US mortgage industry pulls it themselves and they use a, what's called a tri-bureau, meaning they use one that is a combination of Experian, TransUnion and Equifax for both, they list all the scores, as well as the data from all three reports. In Israel, they just need one. One score and one full report from, again, wherever, whichever, whichever country you're from. In addition, the Israeli uh, market now has a credit uh, reporting infrastructure, and this what I mentioned originally in the introduction. Um, I was, uh, was involved in for about a decade from uh, the mid 90s to the mid 2000s. And today um, it is now run by the Bank of Israel. They, they act in a similar way, not exactly, but in a similar way to the repositories, Trend, Eugene, Equifax, um, and Experian. But there are a lot of companies that take the information from them and resell it. But the bottom line is you will pull that, if you don't have anything there, in your Israeli credit report, it's not doesn't count against you like it does in the US or for that matter, Canada. If you do have negative information or a very low score, that could present a problem. And again, there's a little more leeway if you can be explained. For example, I've had clients where they just didn't have credit and they had some very erroneous um, uh, charge, uh, charge offs from a uh, phone company that they didn't, they didn't really use 
or a, uh, a medical bill that was erroneous. And because they didn't have what's called in America, the, a thin, because they had a thin file, they didn't have things to offset it, it killed their credit score, even though you know, they hardly had credit and the mortgages they all had were, you know, they never had a late payment. So those types of things have been able to overcome for clients, but it's something that, you know, each case has its own merits. We've talked about the Bank of Israel. Now the Bank of Israel does many jobs. And I, in, for sure in the US and in Israel, there are multiple government agencies that do the work that this one government agency does. And technically the Bank of Israel is an independent agency, but it, it's busy. And for our context, it regulates the mortgage industry. Everything we've talked about is for the most part based on Bank of Israel parameters. Other than the age issues, everything else is Bank of Israel parameters from qualification to even the multiple parts of the mortgage post-2008, Israelis cannot get a fully adjustable mortgage anymore, meaning you can't have the whole thing on adjustable basis, has to be a third, has to be fixed. Non-Israeli citizens are not limited by the Bank of Israel. The other factors regarding the maximum number of years, and we had discussed prepayment penalty. Prepayment penalties, again, when the Bank of Israel introduced the laws, the banks were charging, um, you know, very high penalties for early prepayment. Today, and this is a law, not even not just a regulation, but the law basically states that if you borrow 5%, and when you go to prepay, the uh, market is at, let's say, 6%, you don't have a prepayment penalty. You, as long as you give them a proper written notification and what banks in Israel do best, there is a fee for it, but there is a, a penalty, meaning it's a 60 shekel fee, but there's no penalty. However, if the reverse was, if you borrow the 6% and you're paying back at, and the market is at five and a half, that half a percent they're losing, there is a calculation that is dictated by law that will determine how much you need to pay, and that's determined on how many, how much the outstanding balance is, and how many years are left on, for the mortgage or until that interest rate is supposed to change. So on a fixed 30 year fixed rate, you can imagine if you pay it off after two years, that that prepayment penalty can be very severe. Let's do a quick summary of mortgages in, in, in Israel. So we have the maximum loan to values, right? A little more stringent than you're, you're used to in North America. We have the mortgage terms up to 30 years, which for the most part is similar to what you have. But the big difference is that age can affect that. So if you're over 50, then you may end up not having a 30 year mortgage amortization. Income qualification is very, very similar in terms of looking at your net. After tax has to be fully documented and any long-term payments you have will be deducted from that and they have to maintain certain ratios. Your US or Canadian credit score, a credit report will follow you. So remember that before you apply that you will have to provide that. Mortgage interest can be fixed, can be adjustable, can be nominal, but can be real. In Hebrew, you call it Samut Ladan or Lot Samut. And you could have one mortgage with all mixture of combinations of all of the above. Mortgage disclosure laws in Israel do exist, but because the market is so young, they have not had the time to evolve to the level that you're used to. So it's important that you ask questions, don't make any assumptions, and make sure you understand what you're getting and what the ramifications are in the future. So one thing we haven't spoken about in this webinar, and it's something we have covered in uh, previous webinars, is the Ministry of Construction and Housing, which is a ministry of the government of Israel. And they, they're the ones who used to provide all the mortgage funding that I discussed before 1990. And in fact, until the end of the 90s, they were 
providing a majority of the mortgage financing. Today, it's a very, very small percentage. The reason is, is because the amounts have not increased with inflation. So the mortgage amounts are so nominal. We're talking about for the for the average OLAB something around uh, fifty to eighty thousand dollars, depending whether you're talking U.S. dollars or Canadian dollars. But it is a very small, um, very small amount. So it, it's not something you cover in this webinar. If you are interested, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to discuss. It's not all pot, but we're going to learn some mortgage vocabulary words that are going to be useful for you to know. You're a borrower. A borrower is called a low vet. You have to sign things. They're chatibot. And by the way, Israel is starting to have digital signatures, at least at the branch, for mortgages. A notary, notario. Your income, your sot. The appraiser is called the shamai, and the appraisal is called the shamot. The mortgage is called the mashkanta. A regular loan is called the halda. Your purchase, acquisition of your property, is called the rikisha. The file fee is called an amalat tik. CPI is known as the madad. And last but not least, interest is called rebit. So that's all for our webinar. But if you have any questions that were not covered, maybe for some of you, you have very standard parameters and maybe this gave you enough information to start on your own. Again, as I said originally, it's important you ask the right questions and know when to ask them at the right time. If others of you, things weren't covered that are important to you, you do have questions, feel free to reach out to me. You can uh, send me a WhatsApp or an email and we'll schedule a time to speak. And to the extent that I can, I'll try to uh, answer your questions. Thank you.